Hello, my name's Adam Novak, and welcome to the first episode in how to make money using your 3D printer. Today we're going to look at just one of my customers, who has allowed me to release some of his designs, which are currently registered, so I can show you how I do my job and earn a living. I will try to do my utmost to provide you with all the information required to avoid any mistakes and misfortunes which I have come across while starting my business. My customer himself owns a manufacturing company and he distributes curtain tracks to installers. So he does not actually install or sell to the public himself. So when he designs his products, he has both his installer and a final end customer in mind. It is important for me to know my customer's needs so that I can address them more efficiently. In the case of this product in front of us, this track began being installed so it was no longer flush against the wall. By doing this, the ends were being shown. He wanted a cap for the end. Usually to prototype this product would take many days for him. He had created resin and inverse molds and then used resins to create this product. And to make adjustments could take days from that because you have to recreate the resins. By using a 3D printer, he can very quickly get the product in his hand with exact measurements so that he can send off the file or the actual printed product and get the die cast molds using that. To get changes done to a die cast mold, if any mistakes are there, can cost many several thousands of dollars at the best of times. That is why by providing this 3D printing service, you can provide the 3D file and a physical model to ensure that no mistakes will occur in the final product. It also greatly speeds up the prototyping process by allowing your customer to be able to send off a 3D visual file and have it registered almost immediately. Another thing most of my customers do love is they can sometimes send off the anonymous functions of the models and send off the measurements instead. In that way, there's very limited chance of stolen ideas or designs, which has happened to some of my customers in the past. And now to begin, the first thing we do is to clock on. In order for us to earn a wage, we need to charge our customer. So check the time, and this is the time that we begin charging. Now begin to take some measurements so that we can enter this into the 3D environment. I use a set of digital veneer calipers. If you're going to be prototyping by design, you definitely need a set of veneer calipers, digital preferably. To insert this cap, I'm going to begin with the organic and curved edge, which we've got measured at approximately seven millimeters. I've taken multiple measurements so I can round it off to an approximate amount. By doing measurements multiple times, you can assure your prototyping will actually be quicker, not slower. I will enter a circle into the 3D environment using Blender. If you don't know Blender, you can learn for free using my other playlist. All the software is also free, all you need is a computer. Once this circle is inside a Blender, I'll push T to open up the toolbar and change the amount of vertices to it, giving it a more smooth and organic shape. I'll then change its dimensions to be 14 by 14, so it is now the seven millimeters that we see here in radius. I'm going to reduce the radius by 0.1 millimeters. This is because I know my 3D printer prints with a tolerance into real life of 0.2 millimeters. So there's often an overhang by the nozzle of 0.2 millimeters in total. So by subtracting 0.1 millimeter from each side now, I'm able to prototype very quickly and easily and ensure I get a finished product for my customer in the quickest time. Since we know the radius of our circle to be 6.9 and we have a measured width of our track at 10.4, all we have to do is subtract 6.9 from 10.4 and extrude this vertice out by that amount so that our 3D prototype is now the same width as the measured track. I will then remember to subtract 0.2 millimeters from this vertice on its axis so that the 3D printed object will come out in real time as the object prototype is necessary. I would then do the same thing to the top vertice of the semicircle by pushing E, then Y, so constraining it to the Y axis, then I can manually type in 15.3. So it's moved up by 15.3 millimeters on the Y axis. This ensures that our model is now exactly 23.2 millimeters on the Y axis, so there's a tolerance of 0.2 millimeters ready for our 3D printer. 
All I do now is to continue to fill in this object, making sure it's clean, so that it's ready for any alterations in future. I'm extruding these edges to the cursor because this I've found to be the quickest way to infill an object and keeping it quite topologically clean. The next thing we're going to do is to create the insert or the plug of our cap. I will separate the semicircle which we have already created and I'm simply going to subtract 1.2 millimeters so that it fits into the measured cap. I'm using 1.2 millimeters because this is the measured width of the wall. Since I know the width of the wall, it is quite easy to make these adjustments. If your object center is at the center of the circle, you can simply subtract 1.2 from the dimensions of the object, which will put it in place very easily. You can push Shift and S to control the cursor location, and Control Alt Shift and C to change the origin of your object. I will then extrude this wall segment out using the same process we've done before, subtracting the width from the current radius, being ensured to leave a 0.2 millimeter gap so that it can fit into the real time cap. I then simply extrude upwards so that we have our plug which will fit inside of our trap. Now we can go to front view or side view and extrude this up so it's a solid object which can be printed. By again using cursor constraint, we can select all of these top vertices and scale it to the 3D cursor. We want to ensure that all these edges are approximately one millimeter thick so that we get at least two layers for this print. Because we are extruding to the 3D cursor, the extrusion on the different edges are of different lengths, so I'll now just make it a bit more even. Once I've done this, I will select the smaller face which we have just created and extrude this inwards. This ensures that the plug itself is hollow and reduces the amount of material needed to print this and quickens our prototyping time. It also reduces the amount of material needed for the die cast mold when finished. Since there are going to be hundreds of thousands of this eventual die cast mold when returned, reducing the quantity of material just a little bit in each of this product can save our customer a lot of money. The next thing I do is to make sure there's no edges, vertices or faces which are overlapping directly together. This is because we're going to use a boolean operation to join them. The boolean operations in Blender work by volume. If we have any overlapping edges or faces exactly or vertices, it could cause problems in the calculation of the boolean operation. I need to flip the faces of the plug, the insert, because they're facing the wrong direction. I do this by selecting all the vertices and pushing Ctrl and N together. This is important for the boolean operation so that the volumes are calculated in the right direction. We can now apply our boolean operation itself. We do this in the properties modifier panel. In this case, we want to use a union modifier. So we change intersector union and then rather than use the B mesh version, we want to change it to carve. This is simply a newer version of the calculated operations. Then using the pipette, we can select the object we want this one to join with. It is good practice to duplicate this object, then apply the Boolean operation. So we've still got a copy of it before we've applied this operation. So that any modifications that need to be done can easily be done to its original object. This is because the Boolean operation itself can change the topology so that ring segments and other modifications can be very hard to do afterwards. Once you have used a Boolean modifier, it is very important to enter edit mode again, select all vertices and remove doubles. The Boolean modifier often creates double vertices on top of each other, which could cause problems when triangulating, exporting or slicing your object. The next thing I do is to check our object using a 3D printing add-on in Blender. This can check it for any errors. It does show some non-flat faces, though because I'm familiar with Blender, I know that when it triangulates this object, it will be quite clean and I can ignore this. 
I now export our object to prototype it at only one millimeter thick for the actual base and about two millimeters for the plug. This is so I can print a very quick stencil and have it in my hand in a matter of minutes. And if I was smart, I would have mentioned to start preheating your printer about five minutes ago so that it's already quite hot. So all we have to do is export this object, print it, and we can see how the stencil fits into our cap. And here it is straight out of the printer. If I pick it up and see how the plug fits into the track, it seems to fit in quite well. Let's see how strong it holds. It does come out a little too easy. So I think I will make the actual plug itself slightly larger. Now let's check the outside of the actual track and how flush it fits. I'm quite satisfied with that. There is a very slight overhang in the outside of the track, but that's often because of a bit of squishing with the bottom layer. So I think that's quite satisfying, especially since it came straight out of the printer without any modifications. Now all I do is to open up the track file again and to create the file that we actually want to send to our customer. The changes I want to make is to actually make this plug fit just very slightly tighter. So I'll make it just 0.1 or 0.05 millimeters tighter on both axes. This is because I know my customer and I know he likes a really tight fit for his plugs. I then just finish off this object by extruding it to the desired height that he specified. He wants about two millimeters on the bottom outside of the plug overhanging and about seven millimeters on the insert. So I move it up by five millimeters on the insert and down by one on the bottom. I can then export this cap one more time and I'll print it to ensure it is correct before I send it to him. Under normal circumstances, the customer himself is required to send you all the measurements so that it is their design. It would be unfair for you to spend 100% of the design work and creation of an idea or invention for someone else to therefore go and register it and own it. You have to be careful of this blurry line between when someone offers you an idea, do they own it, or how much of the input is yours and how much do you own. In this case, I have absolutely no desire to keep this object, so I will send all of the blend file, STL file, and print files. We can now clock off and charge our customer once all the files have been sent. This entire design and printing took me less than half an hour. That is why I charge in half hour increments. It is simply because I can do this so quickly. It is also why I am forced to charge a lot more in my rates than a lot of other people. I charge over $100 an hour and I will not be specific, but for you to charge any less than $100 for prototyping a design when it's exact measurements for something like this, no matter how long it took you, would be way too little. This is also because there are many behind the scene things that need to be done in order for you to continue to earn a wage. Every other day or so, you need to be on road in order to find customers. You also need to spend a lot of time doing administration work such as invoicing and sometimes even chasing up invoices and something called debt to collecting, which can be very frustrating. You will also need to decide on how much you charge for your 3D printing rates and files themselves. For the stencil, I will have stayed clocked on during the stenciling printing stage. Though when I printed the actual final product, I would have clocked off and changed my rates to a 3D printing rate. That is because I find it unfair to charge my same rates for the actual 3D printing process itself rather than design, since my rates are specified for design. Also don't charge my same rates to the public for 3D printing. That is simply because they will never be able to access this service. Nor do I often design for the public, simply because it's very hard for me to find an even balance for me and the customer itself, since they're often hobbyists and not actual businesses. At this moment, when I've sent the file to the customer, I was quite satisfied with it, and I had actually already satisfied my end of the contract. If he requires any more modifications from this point, no matter how slight, it is very important that you do clock on 
because this is your job. You need to get paid. For example, the other day, my customer rang me up and asked me to make this one modification via Skype. It was a simple planar line created from a curve, which took me under a minute to do. I am forced to charge him a minimum rate of half an hour simply because it was work I had to stop what I was doing to create it. And it is my job. I do try to tell my customers when they ask small jobs to try give me many so that they can get the most out of my rates as well. I hope this video has given you the required information for you to earn money from designing and 3D printing. I try to ensure that most of my customers do already have a 3D printer so that when I send them the files they are able to print it straight away and have it in their hands to check. If there is any more information you would like me to specifically add in the next video, please just put it in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. You can help us at EYNTK by sharing this video, subscribing or going to Patreon where we offer some cool things and extra content. Thank you.